this morning I want to take us into the prophet Jeremiah, this 29th chapter, handful of verses that uh, may be f very familiar to you, I hope they are, Jeremiah 29 beginning with verse 10, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be except on your side, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. A future and a hope. The title of the message today from verse 11. The story is behind these verses is this. The people of God have been overrun by a neighboring, neighboring country called Babylon. And Babylon basically defeated them. And in that defeat, the Babylonian leaders started deporting the Jews from their homeland into the land of Babylon. One of the tactics of warfare in those days, you disperse the people, you rattle them up, send them to a new land, a new culture, and it just breaks down everything for future resistance. So the Babylonians deported them in three waves. They started with the educated class, then the artisans, and then the everyday working man. So the first wave went out into Babylon, then the second, and getting ready for the third people had a great deal of angst. The wreckage around them as their current culture was falling apart and they were being sent to a strange land. A lot of angst. What's the future hold for us? In the midst of all that, Jeremiah stands up with a word from the Lord. And he preached to them what I just shared with you. Basically, the Lord said to them, I promise you, you have a future and a hope. And I have a plan for you. Consider how they must have felt as they entered that season of exile. And how it may be similar in many ways to some of the things that you and I may be going through. To them, their life seemed like a total disaster. Now, we're not being sent off to a foreign land, and we haven't been conquered by another nation, but yet, in your individual world, in my world, there can be times in our parish life, there can be times when we feel like our life is just headed for or in the throes of disaster. So how did God minister to people who were in angst? Their life was upside down, inside out, and sideways. Well, the way he ministered to his people back then, he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever is the way he'll minister to us. What are some of the things that we might be suffering from? Well, we're still suffering. We're in the aftermath of COVID. Loss of family. I lost a cousin. My wife lost her aunt. When we were living in New Jersey, Princeton area, when COVID hit, we lost 33 neighbors. 33 in our neighborhood died with COVID. So when they said shelter in place, you better believe we didn't want to leave the house. We didn't leave for 30 days. And uh, the isolation, and, and you suffered too, I know. But the isolation being home for several months, and for some people it was for a year, and others are still a little bit leery about leaving, stepping across the threshold of that front door, like, what's out there, what am I getting into? Job loss, income, and much more. Some 
feel the angst like they're in exile or they're in captivity, Babylonian captivity for you Bible students. Some of us may feel like we're in captivity because of our health. There's some kind of force at work in our body that keeps us from participating in life the way we want to. It's like an invading force that's just sent us in a different direction. We're banished to a bed or to a walker or the MRI table or to waiting in line at the pharmacy every week standing in pharmacy one day and there was this very elderly couple standing holding hands and they were at the counter talking to the pharmacist as he was writing things down furiously and it went on and on. I'm getting impatient here. Please let's get a move on it. Finally he turned around and said to me, I'm sorry but we're getting married and we're making out our wedding registry. <laughs> now some of you know exactly what I mean by that. We have an angst from the comfort of knowing what our future is. And in this particular parish life, there might be some angst here about where are we going now that we've sold our property. We are asked as a parish family just to have complete trust that our vestry is hearing from the Lord and they're at work on this. Are they really doing their job? We don't know. We're just waiting Sunday by Sunday by Sunday. What's going to happen? Are we going to be in worse shape than we are? Are we going to be someplace I can't drive to? Or is it going to be someplace we have to put up with? Is it going to cost more? What, what's the future for us? But God spoke to them, to, to the ancient Jews, through Jeremiah's preaching. He said, I will visit you after a period of 70 years. When you've been taken away and you and your children have lived there for 70 years, I will visit you. I will do a work within you because then you'll be ready to really listen to me. You're not really listening now, but by then you'll be broken enough to listen. And I will speak my word of promise to you. And I want you to know that I have a plan for you. You have a future and a hope. And that plan will begin unfolding when these 70 years of captivity are finished. By the way, if you want the test of whether or not Jeremiah was a prophet, he was bold enough to say, you'll be in Babylon for 70 years and then released. Guess what happened? 70 years later, they were released. He was right on. He would draw everyone together and restore everything they had lost. What is God wanting to do in our lives? The same that he wanted to do for them. When he sent them to Babylon, he wants us to be a people who seeks him with everything we have, who love him without any reservation. And he is such a good and loving father that if we are reluctant to do that in any way, he will allow circumstances, even engineer circumstances, to bring us to the place where we become totally dependent upon him. He wanted to transform these people from the inside out, and I propose that's his ongoing work in me and you, is to transform us from the inside out. I just want to talk to you this morning about two things he said to them. Number one, I have a promise for you. And number two, I have a plan for you. They must have, we'll talk about the promise, they must have felt that God had abandoned them. But God had not abandoned them. They knew this captivity was coming and on some of their friends already, and it would not end tomorrow. They knew it was going to be 70 years long. Thus, many of them knew they could pull out their calculators and their calendars and say, now wait a minute, 70 years, I won't be around to see this. It'll be my children and my grandchildren. 
And they might have thrown their hands up and said, where's God for me? But God counters in verse 11 with a promise. I give you a future and a hope. This is a word to us whenever we suffer for any reason at all. The promise of the gospel is not to deliver us from suffering, but to deliver us in suffering. Know this, that no matter what we go through, God is there always saying, hold on, look to me, I have a future and a hope for you. You talk about the light at the end of the tunnel. I see it, and it's Jesus. The message may be paraphrased as God spoke to them. I'm taking liberty now with the text. It's like God said to them, I have not abandoned you. You are in my thoughts. I have a plan for you. I will bring you back. Make the best of where you are until I bring about my plan. In that new land, build your houses, plant your gardens, live your life. You'll be second, third, fourth, fifth class citizens, but you'll live. Don't worry about it. Trust my promise that I'm giving you. Folks, I want to tell you something about the Christian life. Everything is a promise. Learn to get a hold of God's promises and trust those promises. Live in his promises. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, the apostle said, For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why through him that we utter our amen to the glory of God. The promises of God find a yes. There's no no. What are his promises that we live in every day? He's promised us salvation. If we trust the work of Jesus on the cross, God says, my grace is yours. You will be with me forever in heaven. He's promised us the Holy Spirit. We just had it in the gospel reading. The promise of the Father. That infilling of the Spirit is a promise. He's promised to be with us always. Lo, I am with you always. Remember that promise? He's promised to heal our diseases. He's promised to deliver us. He's promised to remove the sting of death from us. So that when our inevitable day comes as believers, there's no sting in it. It's simply a transition event, a graduation ceremony, as it were. The only pain in it is for those left behind. He's promised to answer prayers. Does he answer your prayers? He answers mine. One fellow said to me one day, ah, oh, this answered prayer business, it's just all a bunch of coincidences. I said, well, all I know is the more I pray, the more coincidences I have. Live on his promises. There are promises in the Bible, in the book, Learn to devour that book every day. Don't rely upon just the scriptures you hear on Sunday morning. But get into that book, engage it, have Bible intake it, make it part of your life, and let God fill you with his promises from that book. And when you're faced with a calamity, an anxiety, a crisis in life, and you don't know what to do, fall to your knees and say, Oh God, I need something to hold on to. Give me a promise. And stay there. Stay there and pray. The old timers called praying it through. Stay there until that promise is deposited in your heart. I don't know if any of you know about an experience I had four years ago. I had suddenly a blood vessel burst in the junction between my stomach and bowel. And I started bleeding internally and didn't know it until I finally had evidence. I got to the ER. I nearly passed out in the, op in the waiting room. Here's where we're going with this. By the time they got me on the gurney, 
my hemoglobin level was 4.1. For those of you who know medicine, a normal man is around 14, 13. Below 7 means death is imminent. I was 4.1. They put the paddles on my chest. My wife was called in. I was in a different city. I was traveling. She got an emergency flight, flight flew out. I was amazed she got there within a few hours. I opened my eyes. There she was standing, or sitting beside me in the ER with her saying words to me like, thank you, you've been a good husband. The ER doctor came in and said, we're ready for a heart attack. Most don't make it. And I'm lying there, my first thought is, am I ready to die? And my answer was yes, I trusted Jesus my whole life. I'm not going to stop in this last moment. And I, I remember having a peace in the sense that I knew where I was going, but having angst, over my wife and son, granddaughter, etc., son-in-law, daughter-in-law, things like that. And I, I remember calling out to the Lord, and they say you fade in and out. That's not the way it was for me. I was either on or off. I was in or out. And I said, well, Lord, uh, you promised to take care of me my whole life, and you have done that. I hold you to nothing else. And just in my heart, another promise was given me. I don't hear God in my head. If you hear voices in your head, we have medicine for that. God speaks to the heart. And that you just know that you know. And I heard a booming voice in my heart that said to me, just three words, I got this. You might think, well, God doesn't talk like that. Yes, he does. See, God talks in these and thous. Maybe to you, but to me, he talks plainly. He said, I got this. And uh, I was in intensive care for two weeks. I had 13 units of blood all together poured into my body. I kept bleeding and had to swallow the camera capsule and all that. They never could. And just as it started, it spontaneously quit and everything healed promises. I got this. When doctor after doctor would come in, when the, when the GI specialist came in and said, we just don't know if you're going to make it. You want to know the truth? We just don't know if you're going to make it. Is your house in order? You cannot fly home. I got this. I held on to the promise. Hold on to your promises. When God speaks to you, that's it. That's it. I'm banking on it. I'm living on it. I'm trusting it. No matter what people say, no matter what the world says, no matter whatever demon in hell throws at me, I'm standing on it. Because God promised me it. The second thing God said is, I have a plan. He gave them the promise, you have a future and a hope. He gave a plan then. They needed this. They wished it was not necessary for them to go off into captivity. But it was necessary in order to bring them to complete dependence upon God. Now you might say, you mean to tell me God gives us difficulties and hard times just so that we trust him more? Isn't that a evidence of some kind of a cruel side to his character. He just takes some kind of joy in knowing that we're having a hard time or we're frustrated because our prayers for healing haven't been answered or our finances aren't where they should be or our neighbor doesn't love us as much as they should and I don't have the job I want and my car doesn't work and you just name it. Isn't that an evidence that God has a cruel side to him? No, it isn't. Because God knows that sometimes we have to have hard measures in our life before we ever break down the callousness around us so that we will sit and say, okay, what am I doing here? What do I need to have done to me? We need sometimes to be knocked around enough before we're willing to listen. What do we need to know? We need to know that if we depend on him as the true higher power, then we have a standard 
that does not change, that's true for everyone, not just a select few. When we come into total dependence upon him, our relationship with him is so sweet that we know that the creator of the universe is greater than any difficulty I have. No matter how big my Goliath is, God is bigger still. And in that relationship, I know that there is strength for me for any challenge I have, any heartache, any brokenness, any loss that I may ever experience. I have found a relationship and a fellowship with God that I needed to get me through this life with great victory. Sometimes it takes breaking experiences to get us to that place. It's as if God said, I'm putting you in a new situation. It'll be good for you. You need this. But they first had to come to full repentance. They had to turn from their self-reliance. God would do a mighty thing in them once their hearts were softened unto repentance. Oh God, it took 70 years for them. Please help me, Lord, that it doesn't take so long. You know, God can do a lot for us when our hearts are softened to repent. But when our hearts are closed and our eyes are blinded by the things we want, by the rathers of the world, things that in the end really don't work out too well, but we just keep doing them over and over hoping they will, then repentance seems irrelevant. I don't need to repent. I have a good job, lots of money. I don't even use my check. It just goes in the bank. My wine cabinet's full. I have two nice cars, a riding lawnmower, a pool. My kids love me. My grandkids love me. My closet is full of clothes. And my wife and I still love each other after all these years. Why do I need to repent? We need to pray for an open heart and open eyes. We may think that we do not need this because everything is rosy for us. I go to church every Sunday and I do my share on the plate. My counsel to you is pray anyway. I don't care what your station in life is, how well seated you are in this world, and how much peace you have at this moment, pray to always have a soft heart towards repentance. Always be soft towards developing that relationship with the Lord. What was God's plan? He said, in so many words, I'm your God. I have not abandoned you. You may feel like it, but I have not. And my plan is this. I will bring you, my people, back to your land, and I will restore everything that was stripped away from you. You will get it all back by divine provision. And these old-timers in the crowd may have hearkened to the message and may have said something very mature. They may have said, well, it's not for me, but praise God, my children will enjoy it. To wrap it up, Israel had to learn an important lesson they were resistant to. Therefore, they went into exile. But not every exile experience you have is designed to break you. Sometimes hard knocks of life just come out of nowhere, and it wasn't God who sent them. Just, it's the nature of this fallen world. And we can feel like everything is for naught. But the principles are the same. 
Get a hold of God's promise to get you through your captivity, your exile. And look for his plan of complete deliverance. He has a plan for your future and your present, just as he did for them. And um, in terms of our church here in this parish, God has a future and a plan for us. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. Amen.